Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, we want to launch right into it, and uh, uh, John did some of my work for me. So uh, evolutionary thought has developed more or less continuously uh, in the life sciences since Darwin, but experienced a case of arrested development in relation to human affairs. This was in part for good reason, given the excesses of social Darwinism. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that uh, a serious effort to rethink the human-related academic disciplines didn't gather steam until the late 20th century. And applying evolutionary thought to real-world domains, such as business, is more recent still. So there's three waves of evolutionary thought. And the third wave is very recent indeed. This is, I think, it's hard, a little bit hard to think of the present moment as historic. But I do think that historians will look back upon this period as one of integration for um, uh, human-related knowledge uh, comparable to the integration of biological knowledge during the 20th century, which of course is um, continuing. And I think an indication of that is that Stern is the first school to seriously relate modern evolutionary science to the world of business. This is proof enough that the third wave of evolutionary thought is just that recent. So what I want to do in my first talk here is to first of all uh, briefly state what is the evolutionary perspective, why is it so general, why does it begin proving its worth right away? And then to review a few key evolutionary concepts most relevant to business, which is going to be elaborated on in the subsequent uh, talks. And my background for this is that uh, the Evolution Institute, which started in 2007 and got me into the business of formulating public policy from an evolutionary perspective. And in 2008, the economic crash prompted us to uh, uh, start in a, a collaboration with the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, which is uh, one of NSF's largest <coughs> evolution-related centers, to uh, rethink economics from an evolutionary perspective. This has been a multi-year process. It's involved a large advisory group representing a melting pot of, uh, of disciplines and resulted in a special issue of the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, which is just coming out. Some of the articles are already online, which is, um, of course, very close to what might happen in uh, uh, business. And the strategy for the um, special issue was to first to acknowledge that economic and evolutionary thought had been entwined throughout their histories. So it goes all the way back to Smith and, and Malthus. But nevertheless, evolution does not function as a general theoretical framework for economics as it does in the life sciences. It comes in here and there, but it does not work in economics as it does in the life sciences. And the purpose of the special issue is to explore whether this is a problem, and if so, how it can be addressed. And the audience that we have in mind for the special issue are open-minded colleagues. John, I think, also pointed to this. Most economists are perfectly friendly to the concept of evolution. Some related to their work in one way or another, and even those who don't assume that their ideas are consistent with it. And so in my vast experience talking to people about evolution, uh, open-minded people about evolution, we get the same question again and again. Some of you in this audience have this question. Many people who hear these videos are going to have this question. Here it is. What is the added value of a more explicit evolutionary perspective for my discipline that I and my colleagues have not already achieved without such a perspective? And this is a good question that deserves a respectful answer, and the purpose of the special issue is to provide that answer. So what is the evolutionary perspective? This is Nico <laughs> Tinbergen, who won the Nobel Prize for founding the field of ethology, and he wrote a classic paper in 1963. If you go back then, what Tinbergen was trying to establish was that behaviors are traits like anatomical traits, that so we can study the evolution of behaviors in the same way that we study anatomical traits. <laughs> Uh, traits. And that was a point that had to be established as recently as the 1960s. And so in this paper, he was just trying to say, what does it mean to study behavior as a branch of biology? And in the process, he gave a very concise description of what biologists do for all traits. And that is to ask four questions, four independent questions. What's its function? What's its mechanism? What's its development? What's its history? And more recently, with the advent of cultural evolution, now we need to ask these four <coughs> questions for cultural evolution. And so in a nutshell, this is the toolkit that evolutionary biologists use to study all traits in all species, from molecular biology to, to the fossil record, to the distribution of, of, uh, of species, to their relationship with each other and their environments. And evolutionary biologists such as myself routinely switch between topics and, and organisms because we're using the same 
toolkit, the same conceptual toolkit. And this is actually a gallery of the species that I have worked on during my, my uh, career. So if the human-related disciplines can be this transdisciplinary, of course there is every reason to uh, become so. And this perspective begins proving its worth right away. It's not as if evolutionary theory provides <laughs> all the answers. What it does do is provide a way of organizing information and guiding the search for new information. It began to function this way for Darwin and his contemporaries from the very beginning. And in second wave evolutionary thought, when people, and many of you have had this experience, you talk to a social scientist or human behavioral scientist who has now become excited about evolution, and that's what they say. They say, now so much makes sense to me, this organizes the information of my discipline. And unsurprising in retrospect, it can also be the experience with third wave evolutionists. And I like to say there's two kinds of insights. One is evolution 501 insights, sophisticated new discoveries that's based on developments in genetics, neurobiology, and so on. But the other is what I like to call evolution 101 insights based on foundational principles that are new against the background of other perspectives. And I think it's the evolution 101 insights that in many respects are the most uh, important. Here's an example, the importance of relative fitness. So, at a foundational level, natural selection is based on relative fitness, yet most economic theorizing and much intuitive thinking assumes that individuals behave to maximize their absolute utility. Economists had a century or more to correct this assumption of absolute fitness thinking, but for the most part they didn't, except for here and there. And so it's left for us today, in the current moment, especially Bob Frank's talk, I think, today, and in his most recent book, The Darwin <coughs> Economy, to make this elementary observation is that really, in order to make sense of things, we need to think in terms of relative fitness, not absolute uh, fitness. This is one of the uh, papers in the special issue with John Gowdy and, and uh, co-authors, uh, and what's sometimes called the holy trinity of orthodox economics, rationality, greed, and equilibrium, are based on cosmologies of thought that go back for centuries and, and are so deeply rooted that we don't recognize them as, sumption, as assumptions. One is the concept of natural man as rational, self-sufficient, egotistical. The idea that competition among individuals leads to a well-functioning society and that there exists an optimal harmonious state of nature that we just need to leave it alone and if we interfere with it then we will dis disrupt it. Now these cosmologies have influenced evolutionary thought as well as economic thought, but in, in part of this new wave of evolutionary thinking that you referred to, I think evolutionary thinking has gone beyond these cosmologies and can help economics go beyond them also. Homo economicus is dead even if it remains in a zombie-like state. And behavioral economists, I think, have made progress, but when you look at most behavioral ecologists, uh, behavioral economists, and Bob Frank made this point during his remarks uh, at last night's dinner, they don't sufficiently address the four uh, questions. Often they focus uh, more or less exclusively on proximate mechanisms and not the other um, questions. And evolutionary psychology as a self-described discipline has been problematic in some aspects of its development, but at the end of the day, treating the human mind as a product of genetic evolution is going to yield many important insights but are relevant to both business and marketing, and Steve and Jeffrey are going to be addressing that, among others, in this uh, talk. And at the same time, while we're thinking about the genetically evolved mind, we also have to think of evolution as something that goes beyond genetic evolution. That evolution requires variation, selection, and heredity, not genes. Genes are one mechanism of heredity, and there's other mechanisms that evolve by genetic evolution, including epigenetic mechanisms, types of learning found in many species, and types of symbolic thought that are distinctively uh, human. And this book, Evolution in Four Dimensions, is, a, is an important book to read on, on that. And what this does, uh, I think, is reconcile the paradox that on the one hand, like all species, our minds are elaborately evolved genetically, and on the other hand, we have an elaborate capacity for open-ended flexibility. These two things have been seen apart from each other, for the most part, uh, but now they can be all brought within the orbit of um, evolutionary theory. And so what that means is, is that we can begin to think about our capacity for fast-paced change, including the kind of change that we want and the kind of change that happens despite the fact that we don't want it. We can see of this as basically evolution and warp drive, and we can think about managing the evolutionary uh, uh, process. 
John alluded to the, uh, the multi-level selection. I like to call it the iron law of multi-level selection. I think it's taken a long time for biologists to become a consensus for this, but this should really be something that all evolutionists are taught, that in a multi-chair hierarchy, groups within groups within groups, for, what, for any level to become adaptive, there has to be a process of selection at that level, and selection at lower levels <coughs> tends to be disruptive to selection at higher levels. So very simply, what's good for me can be bad for my family. What's good for my family can be bad for my clan. What's good for my clan can be bad for my nation. What's good for me can be bad for my business. What's good for my business can be, for, for my corporation, can be bad for the larger uh, economy. And this is profoundly different than the concept of the invisible hand, which pretends that individual self-interest robustly leads to the common good. If you go to the most recent dictionary of economics, Palgrave Dictionary of Economics, you will find laissez-faire le um, leads to the common good is the first fundamental uh, theorem of welfare economics. Now it turns out that there is a legitimate concept of the invisible hand from an evolutionary perspective, a very interesting one, but it's very different than the received um, uh, version. Uh, this is Eleanor Ostrom, who many of you know won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for showing that groups who attempt to manage common pool of resources, such as this amazing irrigation system in uh, the island of Bali, are capable of doing so, but only if they possess certain design features, which she articulated. And I was uh, privileged to work with uh, Lynn Ostrom uh, for the few years before her very unfortunate death last year, and that resulted in this paper, part of the special issue, in which we generalized the core design principles. We generalized it in two ways. First, to show that they follow not just from political science and, and game theory, but from evolutionary theory at a fundamental level. And secondly, therefore, they apply to a wider range of groups. And I think this provides something close to a how-to guide for looking at the design of business groups, among other uh, groups. And then finally, we have the implications for ethics and the Center for Business Systems Ethics that, uh, that John is starting <coughs> here. And the, the concept that John is, is working on, as I understand it, is, is basically ethics is not something that can be taught. You don't just teach a class and tell people <coughs> to be ethical. It's a systemic property. And you need to build an ethical system. And if you don't, then what's happening is, is that you have selection forces, evolutionary forces, which are favoring unethical practices in, in just the same way as in genetic evolution when selection operates at lower levels. And so, and so ethics is a systemic property. And so here's a review of the objectives for my talk. I wanted to um, define the evolutionary perspective, why it's general, why it begins proving its worth right away, and some key concepts for business. And thank you very much.